Hi everyone. I want to start with some thoughts I've gleaned from various resources and some I've just been pondering. I know I introduced you to myself that are here, but I want to also introduce myself to those who are going to be watching this. My name is Margot Rocks and I'll be sharing the brief introduction to our study on the Sermon on the Mount. Heavenly Father, may the words I have prepared be heard with ears seeking to learn from you today. Amen. What has become known as the Sermon on the Mount are the lengthiest teachings of Jesus found in the Gospels. They cover three chapters in the book of Matthew. And I'd like to start at the end. In Matthew 7, 28 and 29, the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, uh, this is the following statement that is made. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. The Jews paid heed to the teachings of the scribes. They occupied an important place in first century Jewish society. Scribes were ex experts in the Old Testament law and the people regarded their scriptural interpretation as binding. Because of this, and because scribes took care of the scrolls on which the Bible was written, scribes held seats of honor in the synagogues. And you had to be a scribe to sit on the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of the Jews. The scribes also served as civil lawyers in any case, the scribes taught by citing the opinions of various rabbis or different schools of thought. They would say, Rabbi so-and-so said this, or the school of Hillel, or whatever, one of those, those are the, the way they taught. They didn't appeal to their own authority, but to the authority of others. Jesus didn't do this. When he instructed people in this study, you're going to read what Jesus will say. You have heard it said. And then he'll tell you something. And then he said, but I say to you. So Jesus was teaching in a totally radical way from anything that the people of that day were familiar with. It could be easily one of the way, reasons the leaders of the day were out to get him because they, he wasn't doing it right. He, he, he didn't do what we're used to and comfortable with. The, this discourse was the, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. So he was gathering disciples and crowds were coming to be healed and to hear his teachings. So he presented these vignettes on what it meant to be one of his followers, because he did have followers. He had not only had his close-knit group, but he had a bigger group than that. And then he had crowds, masses of people who wanted to hear what he had to say. These teachings are considered major ideals of the Christian life. There are so many hard and sometimes confusing teachings that we will be examining in the coming weeks. Some of the best known scripture are found in these passages, including the Beatitudes, blessed are those, and the Lord's Prayer. How many of you know the Lord's Prayer by heart? A couple of you, just one or two. Okay, yeah, you all know the Lord's Prayer. There are only a few things I want to focus on today. This is gonna be really short. First is that Jesus knows us. He knows we need something to strive for. We just finished the Summer Olympics and the people that competed in them worked very hard to win. 
They had to win things before they could even get to be in the Olympics. And you can believe they were going for the gold. These teachings are showing us the path to win at the task of living as followers of Jesus. He also knows us well enough to know that we are fallen, sinful people. We're not going to accomplish this task on our own merit. We cannot reflect Christ to the world without the power of Christ in our lives. In Jesus' teaching on the vine and the branches, he uses this as an illustration that we need to be rooted in him. He says in John 15, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Another favorite verse is Philippians 4, verse 13. Paul is writing to the church from prison. And he's talking about being content in all circumstances. Starting in verse 12, he shares, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And then in verse 13, he summarizes by saying, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Jesus doesn't expect us to do it on our own. The second thing I want to point out for you to be pondering is that Jesus lived what he taught. He reached out to the brokenhearted and downtrodden. He included those shunned by others and the marginalized. He corrected wrongs and taught a better way. He's not teaching these lessons to point out our sins or cause us to feel guilty, though sometimes we need to, to get us back on the right path. But his path to the cross was so we could be free of condemnation and discover the freedom of knowing him. We aren't meant to feel like a failure or point our fingers at others and act like the Pharisees to push ourselves up so that we can feel better about ourselves. We were meant to live in the power of Christ in us. Apologizing when we're wrong, getting back up after we fall or fail, and in knowing that our lives are not about us. So uh, there's three things I'd like you to do while we participate in this study. I don't think you need to write this down, it's pretty simple. One, pray. Ask God to show you a new truth. Second, read through the passage. If you have time, read it through again and again. Third, even before you read a single question in the study guide, write down what you see in the passage. Write down any questions that you might have and write down anything that God might be telling you to do. Now this shouldn't be too hard since our passages are way shorter than some of the studies that we've done. But I'm gonna give you a little thing for overachievers. Those of you that go, oh, that's easy, I can do all that. Well, here you go. <laughs> Memorize a verse or a passage or even the whole section. If, I mean, there are people that memorize whole books of the Bible. This is just three chapters. You can do it, but maybe take a familiar verse. All of us can do this. Learn its address, like Matthew, whatever, and the actual wording. Now, just a quick question. 
How many of you know that the Lord's Prayer is found in Matthew 6, 9 through 13? I didn't. I always say it. We say it in church all the time. But I didn't know that it's Matthew 6, 9 through 13. So all of us can learn that. That's a little tiny thing to learn. You already know the prayer. So I'm delighted that you have chosen to study with us these passages in this fall. We want to seek what God has in store for us as we're challenged by Jesus' words to the people. And I'm going to ask you to pray with me as we ask God to enrich our lives in the weeks ahead. Dear God, thank you for the power of Christ in our hearts that enables us to live our lives for you. Every, that we can reflect who you are and what we say and what we do. May others be drawn to you by the way we live. And may we find strength in the power of your love for us. Amen.